uh, Hansons want you to know that they're not offended before I even start preaching. They had somewhere they had to be, so that's why they left. <laughs> okay. Bible. Oh, I left my notes in my Bible case. First Timothy chapter six. First Timothy chapter six. Verses. Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 12. First Timothy chapter 6, uh, verses 6 through 12. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. When it says there, they that will be rich, it's talking about the word will there, it's talking about uh, desiring or wanting to be rich, right? To will something is to want it. So it's saying the people who desire to be rich, okay, will fall into temptation snare, into very many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses." I want to talk to you this morning about the root of all evil. The root of all evil. Let's pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you would lead and guide uh, uh, me as I speak today. Father, fill me with your spirit. Give me, Father, an ability I do not have to properly explain and apply your word. Father, this is a problem that's not new. It was around in Paul's day. It's been around since the beginning of time, and it is certainly a very big problem in the United States of America today. Father, I pray that you would open our eyes, that we would be able to see how dangerous this problem is. And I pray, Father, that you would change our thinking this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. I was talking to my brother on the phone yesterday. I actually talked to him for two and a half hours. I was doing other stuff while we were talking. But, and I asked him a question, and he is funny. I guess he and I, we, we think a lot alike. But I asked him a question. I said, have you ever wondered why? I was like, have you been reading my sermon notes? I said, have you ever wondered why we switched from saying, the love of money is the root of all evil, to saying money is the root of all evil, there's a pretty big difference, isn't there, between the love of money being the root of all evil and money being the root of all evil. He said, oh, that's easy. So we could condemn rich people for having money. That's exactly right. If you think money is the root of all evil, you can judge rich people for having money. And you let yourself completely off the hook every time you read this passage. But the Bible does not say that money is the root of all evil. The Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. But is that really true? I mean, what if you put me on a desert island where there was no money? 
would that mean I would have no evil in my life because there's no money? And so how can I love it if it's not there? So therefore, would that be a way to escape from the love of money is just to go somewhere where there was no money? Or how about just have no more money in society? Wouldn't that fix everything? Because then you couldn't love it if it wasn't there. And what about like all evil? That seems kind of extreme. How could that? That's like seems like a really, really extreme statement. The love of money is the root of all evil. So I thought about that. Some translations say the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So it's saying there are many evils that come from the love of money, but in the Greek, it actually uses the word all. It doesn't use the word many or many kinds. It actually uses the word all. Um, money, I want you to think about it. It didn't say that money is the root. It said love of money is the root of all evil. So I want you to think about it. What is the love of money? Well, what do you use money for? You use money to get something that you don't have. So you need something, you go to the store and you buy it because you don't have it. So money is a tool that you use to get something that you don't have. So if you love money, you're loving the tool that you use to get something you don't have. So the love of money is discontentment. So when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, what it's really saying is discontentment is the root of all evil. Not money, but the love of it, right? And I thought about that. Discontentment brought sin into the world. Eve had a perfect husband, perfect life, everything was perfect. She didn't have any kids. Well, it was quite peaceful in the garden. <laughs> and I always tell you, you know, she had a perfect husband because her husband was sinless. She had everything perfect in the garden, no pain, no suffering, and she had no children yet. And she was discontent. And that started all the sin in the world, didn't it? Discontentment. Discontentment brought sin into the world, and discontentment causes more problems than any other sin. Discontent. If we were content, we would be tempted by very little sin. The sin that we're tempted to do all is related to this being discontent. So when we define the love of money as discontentment, we can say, yeah, that pretty much is the root of all evil, isn't it? Discontentment. But we are going to talk specifically about money today, not just discontentment, because that is specifically what Paul's referring to in this passage. Not only did discontentment bring sin into the world, but do you realize that Jesus Christ was betrayed by Judas because of the love of money. He betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was nailed to the cross because of the love of money. So we can see that the love of money causes a lot of damage, doesn't it? Not money, but the love of money. Money just a tool. Nothing wrong with having money. But the love of money is the root of all evil. You're supposed to love God and love people. You're not supposed to love money. If you love money, that's going to cause a lot of problems for you. You know, in your King James Bible, the word evil does not mean sin. When the King James Bible uses the word, is referring to sin or wickedness, it will use the word sin or wickedness. The word evil, we have actually changed the meaning of the word evil today. We use the word evil to refer to something like we say Hitler is evil, or maybe your favorite or least favorite politician, you'll say that person is evil. That's not actually what the word evil means. And the Greek word as well that it comes from, and also in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word that is translated evil is actually not referring to sin. What it's actually, have you ever read the verse? Well, I talked about this a few months ago when I talked about, um, uh, when I preached out of uh, Lamentations, and it says, does not from the mouth of God both good and evil come forth? It's not saying God sins. It's saying evil is actually something bad that happens to you. That's what evil is. So, for example, if I told you, oh, I had an evil week, 
It didn't mean that I was a wicked person. It meant that bad things happened to me. That were bad. There's a lot of passages in the Bible that we use the word evil that way. The word evil does not mean sin. Now, the love of money does cause a lot of sin, but the love of money itself is sin. So the point of the passage is not <coughs> primarily that the love of money will cause you to sin, even though it will. But the point is the love of money will actually cause, listen, bad things to happen to you. Things that you don't want to happen to you will happen because you love money. That's what he actually meant. That's what Paul actually meant, and you see it in the entire passage. He talks about people erring from the faith and drowning in destruction and perdition. He talks about them um, bringing a snare. He talks about them uh, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. That's talking about bad things happening to you because your priorities are wrong because you love money. So I want you to understand that when the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil, it's saying when you love money, you are loving it because it will get you something that you don't have that you want, so you're not content. And that ambition, that desire to always get more, to always get more, to make more money, to make more money, to have, to have, to get, to get, to get, to receive, to receive, to receive, that <coughs> desire is not just a sin, but it will actually destroy your life. It'll actually destroy your marriage. It'll actually destroy your children. It'll actually destroy your truth. That desire to get more and never be content and always want more and more and more and that desire that will focus in on money because money will be your ticket, your tool to get more things that you want. That desire will cause you to make decisions that will destroy you and destroy other people around you. The love of money is the root of all evil. Discontentment and the desire for more things will actually cause you to have many, many bad things to actually happen to you. It'll be the opposite of what you want. You think getting more money, making more money, having more money will make you happy, and it will actually make you miserable. Because there are so many problems that will come into your life. Listen, not because of the money, but because of your love for money. There are millionaires who are Christians who are the happiest people you've ever met. Money does not make you miserable. It doesn't buy happiness, but it doesn't sell happiness either. You can be happy and be rich. You can be happy and be poor. It's not about the money. It's the love of the money. That's the whole problem. The love of money is not just wrong. It is wrong. But it also causes serious problems in your life. If you actually examine your life and a lot of the bad things and the bad things that happened to you, a lot of the mistakes, you can trace it all back to love and money. If you actually just look back over your life, think over a lot of the problems you've had, and you can trace it back to love of money. And if you can't trace it back specifically to the love of money, you can trace it back to discontentment. Because when you're not content, and your priorities are wrong, and you're not seeking first the kingdom of God, you'll make all kinds of choices. And listen, you're not going to like the consequences of those choices. Any choice that's made with the wrong priority. In this passage, the Apostle Paul is trying to teach Timothy how to view money in their life, in his life, how to have a right attitude towards money, and how to be content. And so we need this today. We need to have our mind reprogrammed because I want to tell you something. The reason that we have this problem with loving money is because it's just logical, right? You just think, okay, I need to pay my next bill. How am I going to pay that bill? Money. So logically speaking, we think, well, I need to find a way to get money so I can pay that bill. I need to buy a house. How am I going to buy a house? Money. Okay. And then, and so I need money to get that. How do I? It's, it's, a, it's a deception, folks, because logically in your mind, you're thinking about all these things that you need and sometimes all these things that you want. And as you think about them, logically, it just seems to you that money is the answer to all those things. And so if you don't think deeper if you don't see that God is the one who created everything, and God is the one who promises to provide for your needs, and God is the one who gives you health, and God is the one who gives you a job, and God is the one who gives you air to breathe, and God is the source of everything you have. If you don't look beyond the money to God, you'll make money your God. you make money your God. Every single thing in your life will go down the toilet. 
because you're not seeing where everything really comes from. Listen, your house did not come from money. It came from God. Your car did not come from money. It came from God. Everything that you have comes from God, not from money. But money is deceiving. It's like magic. There's this piece of paper, and you hand it to someone, and that person hands you something, and now you've got something. It's so deceiving, folks. It's so subtle. But everything you have comes from God. Amen. There's a wonderful verse, Deuteronomy 8.18. It is the Lord God that giveth thee power to get wealth. God told them, he said, you told the children of Israel, you know what you're going to do when you go to the promised land? You're going to get so comfortable. You get so fat, sassy, everything's so wonderful. You're going to forget God, and you're going to start worshiping idols and doing other things. And he said, you know what you need to remember? It is the Lord God that giveth thee power to get wealth. We need to see that everything we have comes from God. And so we worship God, not money. We use money. But we love God. We use money. We love God. The love of money is the root of all evil because it replaces your love for God. It becomes your focus. It becomes your constant obsession. And now all of the decisions you make will center around getting money and you'll destroy all your relationships, including your relationship with God. And listen, it's the root of all evil or it's the root of all bad things that are going to happen to you. Listen, you will not like the results of being focused on and obsessing with money. Because God will provide for all your needs if you seek first the kingdom of God. If you just seek first the kingdom of God, God will provide for all of your needs. So in this passage, as we correct our thinking and realize we need to completely cleanse our mind of this desire for money, not that we would not use money, but that we would not love it. We wouldn't have this unhealthy focus on it, desire for it. We wouldn't make that our priority. If we do that, we can actually, God will actually bless us, and we will actually have money, and we'll actually be able to use it and be happy. There's a wonderful verse in Proverbs, isn't there? The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. And you know, in this passage, it talks about people who pierce themselves through with many sorrows. You know, when you focus on money, you'll pierce yourself through with many sorrows. But when you focus on pleasing God, he'll bless you, and now there's no sorrow with the money that he gives you. It's all blessing. There's nothing negative in it. So we need to have our minds reprogrammed, our minds cleansed, our minds. The Bible talks about the washing of water with the word. Okay? We have wrong thinking. And Paul wrote this, and the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this to straighten out our wrong thinking about money. And starting in verse 8, it says this And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So the first thing we need to think about is food and raiment. Okay? That's the first principle food and raiment. He says this, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. The Apostle Paul says this, the only thing, there are two things that you actually need in life. By the way, he doesn't even add a house in this. It's kind of interesting. There's only two things you need in life. In order to live, you need two things. You need food and you need clothes. First of all, food. Obviously, <laughs> you need food to stay alive. You will die if you don't eat. So that's kind of basic, isn't it? You need food. And then we might say, well, obviously you need clothes, and here's what we would say, and we're wrong. We need clothes because it's cold in Wisconsin in the winter. That's why we need clothes. You know Paul wasn't writing in Wisconsin. Do you know in the Middle East, it's hot most of the year. Uh, you know our missionaries, we support the, the Rogers family. The coldest day they ever had in G. Paranai, it was 78 degrees, and everyone was wearing jackets. Not kidding. The coldest, day or night, that was the coldest temperature they had. When they were here, they said in the entire last year, the coldest temperature they had, and the coldest time of year was 78 degrees. They were in the jungle, the Amazon jungle. 78 degrees. That was the coldest temperature they recorded. That's a record. <laughs> 78 degrees and probably 80% humidity because they live in the jungle. We would think that sunbathing weather, okay? Listen, we just watched, our family just watched a movie, The End of the Spear, okay? Some of you have seen that about the Alka martyrs and uh, Steve Saint, Nate Saint was was, uh, was killed by the, in, in Ecuador, okay? And listen, for that movie, now originally, 
um, the Aukas wore no clothing. So in order to make the movie, they actually had to make it inaccurate in order for it to be a clean new movie. <laughs> so the Aukas said, well, we'll just take off all our clothes because that's the way it was. And they're like, no, 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 we can't do that. That would be X-rated in America, so we can't do that. It's supposed to be a Christian movie. <laughs> so they had to put uh, some skimpy clothes on them in order to make it a clean movie. But here's why I'm bringing this up. The Aukas didn't need clothes. It was hot. It was hot in the jungle. They didn't need clothes. They could live without clothes. So why does Paul say a minimum is we have to food and clothes? Because you need food to stay alive. You need raiment to stay morally pure. Do you remember what God told that did with Adam and Eve in the garden? It says their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked. Now I have to, I have to laugh about that because, and you know you can see this um, in uh, children like uh, the two year old. A two-year-old, have you ever been a mom and you're giving your two-year-old a bath and somehow the two-year-old escapes and goes running out naked? And you're like, come back here, get back here, ah, my kid is running around naked. Okay. Does your kid think he's wearing clothes? So why did God say their eyes were open and they knew that they were naked? Because they knew that they were naked before they ate the fruit. In other words, they knew that they weren't wearing clothes. What he meant was not that they knew that they weren't wearing clothes. When he said their eyes were open, they knew that they were naked. He means they got the knowledge of good and evil, so now they had an understanding, listen, of the meaning of nakedness. Nakedness in a world of sin can lead to moral, pure, moral impurity. And they had that understanding. Even though there's just two of them and their husband and wife, I understand that, but they had that understanding. Oh, wait, this isn't going to work anymore because we're living in a world of sin where people can do right and wrong and choose wrong, and this isn't going to work anymore. Now, people who are living out in the jungle, they don't know God, so they don't have any concept of... It, 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 they're not worried about falling into sin, many of them. And so because of that, it wasn't necessary for them to wear clothes. But I'll tell you something. When you understand God's design for you, you will understand you need clothes to stay morally pure. You do. You need food to live, but you need clothes to stay morally pure. Now listen. Why didn't he say you need a car to get to church? Why didn't he say you need a house to live in? Well, do you know there's a lot of places where if it's warm enough and the weather's nice, you don't even need a house. You can live in a tent. Abraham lived in a tent his whole life. He never had a house. Some people live in tents their whole life. They don't have a house. Most people could have probably afforded a cheap tent, even if they could never afford a house. Do you know a house is actually not a basic necessity? Now, I understand here in Minnesota, in what I mean here in Minnesota, here in Wisconsin, in the cold winter, you actually do need a house. I get that. But Paul's just making a statement, like just a general statement, just not about a specific region of the world, but just in general. And you know what else? You can rent all your life and you can move from place to place. And it might not be a very happy life, but listen, but you can still live that way. There are people who never own a house. They just kind of drift from place to place. There are people who live are homeless their entire life. They live. Some of them live to be 80, 90 years old. They're homeless. They don't have a house, but they can still live. Now, the Apostle Paul isn't saying you shouldn't have a house. I'm sure everyone he wrote to here had a house. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's not a basic necessity of life. It isn't. Food and clothes are actually the basic necessity of life. That's a fact. And the Apostle Paul says something. He says, you know, the only there's only two things you actually need. You need food to stay alive, and you need clothes to stay morally pure. And that's true. You do need clothes to stay morally pure. And obviously that would lead to sin, and therefore raiment is a necessity. It is a necessity. Those are the only two things. Now the Apostle Paul is not saying just wander around stuffing yourself with food and wearing clothes, and that's all you need. We know he's not saying that. What he's doing is he's explaining something. He's explaining that that's all you really need. You know why? I'll tell you why. It's because when you think anything more than food and clothing is something you absolutely need, that will cause you to love money. And you'll justify by saying, oh, I have to have a house. I, I, I have to have a car. I have to have nicer clothes. I have to have a nicer house. I have to have a nicer car. I have to, I have to, I have to know. The Bible says... All you have to have is food and clothes. A 
covering for your body. That is actually all you have to have. He's not saying that's all you're allowed to have. He's saying that's all you have to have. You know why? Because if you actually believe that, if I actually believe that, this morning I had breakfast. I had a boiled egg, piece of toast, coffee. I had breakfast. Food. I'm wearing clothes. I'm fine. Did you know that if while I'm here preaching, my house burns down, I can still be happy. Because I had breakfast this morning, and I have clothes. Folks, that's what the Bible says. It's not that you're not allowed to have more. And it's not that everybody in the Bible didn't have more. They did. There are probably very few people in the world that have only food and clothes. Most people have something more than that. There are a few, like almost people. But most people in the world actually have more than food and clothes. But here's what Paul's saying. He's saying, pause and think, what do I have to have? Truly, what is God saying you have to have? Only two things, food and clothes. That's all. Nothing else. By that standard, are we all really, really rich? We are very rich. Most of us have way more food than we should. Most of us have way more clothes than we should. And we have cars, and we have houses, and even if we don't own a house, we probably can rent a pretty nice place. Folks, we have a lot. And if we just stop and agree with God and say, God, you know you're right. I have food and, I'm cl and I have clothes. And I know that you're going to always provide for my needs for food and clothes. I don't foresee a time when I'm not going to have food and clothes. So God, you know what? Money doesn't matter anymore. But do you see how overcoming your love of money starts with understanding what your needs are? Overcoming your love of money starts with saying, all I actually have to have is food and clothes. When you get to that point, when you agree with God, see, it doesn't matter how you feel. All that matters is that you agree with the Bible. You see, we like to say, I believe the Bible from cover to cover. I believe Genesis to Revelation. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. And oh, I love John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And whosoever believed in him should not perish but everlasting life. Oh, praise the Lord. I believed in him. I'm not going to perish. I'm going to have everlasting life. I know I'm going to heaven. Wonderful. I love the Bible. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. My favorite verse is John 3, 16. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. My favorite verse is John 3, 16. And then one day someone quotes 1 Timothy 6, 8. And we go, I don't believe that. You're just starting down the road of the root of all evil if you don't agree with 1 Timothy 6 8. And Paul knows that. And that's why he says, I made a statement. The love of money is the root of all evil. But that statement does not make sense unless you start with 1 Timothy 6 8 and say, All I actually have to have to live is food and clothes. That's all I have to have to live. Now, everything else. It's extra. It's a blessing from God. Now you won't love money. Here's what you'll do. When you work a job and you get a paycheck, you'll go, okay, I have some money now. I think I will get something more than just food and clothes because God blessed me with money. Now you'll be thankful for the money and you'll use it for something. And you'll say, and every, praise the Lord, I got another paycheck. Now I get to have like two pairs of clothes. Praise the Lord, I got another paycheck. You know, I think I might actually like to put a down payment on a house or put a or put a security deposit down on a place to rent. I'm kind of tired of sleeping in my car. Praise the Lord. And you get another paycheck, or someone gives you some money, or you get a better job. And you go, you know, praise the Lord. I think I'll get a better. You know, my 1970 when I got married, I drove a 1978 Volkswagen Rabbit. My 1978 Volkswagen Rabbit. I think I could probably afford a 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit. So I did. I, I jumped four years. Went from 1978 to 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit. And you know what, though? I look at that and I go, wow, Prince, I want you blessed me. I had a 1978 Volkswagen Rabbit, which I didn't even need, according to the Bible, because I had to get close. But you know, I found a 1982 Volkswagen Rabbit, and I had the money to buy it. So praise the Lord, I bought it. Wow, now you're happy. You don't love money. You use money. You love God, and you love people. You're not making bad decisions because you're not focused on money. You'll use money, but you're not focused on money. It's so important. Can you see how that is foundational? To start with this, uh, God says, all I need is food and clothes. Even if I'm homeless, if I have food and clothes, I can be content. What? Yes. That's the Bible. 
it doesn't do you any good to say you believe John 3.16 if you don't believe 1 Timothy 6.8. Because the person who denies 1 Timothy 6.8 could go down a path where eventually he denies John 3.16. Because it becomes your opinion at some point, at that point. Which verses am I going to believe? Which verses? No, you've got to believe the whole Bible. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. And the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It's all there for your profit. So we have to believe 1 Timothy 6 8. So the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit, is retraining us so that we stop this loving of money. And so we start with saying, What are my basic needs? My basic needs are food and raiment. So that's the first principle, food and raiment. Here's the second principle. It's another word that starts with F. It's the word fall. In verse 9, he said, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. When he said to be content with food and raiment, and then he says, They that will be rich are those who desire to be rich. That's the very next verse. What do you think he's referring to by those who desire to be rich? People who think they need more than food and raiment. It's the very next verse. Right? We always talk about studying in context. <laughs> What's the context? If I have food and clothes, I'm content. But those who want to be rich, who is someone who wants to be rich? Someone who's not content with food and clothes. Now, we're not talking about not allowed to have more. We're talking about not being content with that. Do you understand? That's what we're talking about. So when you say food and raiment is not enough, now you're saying, I want to be rich. I love money. I love, I want more. I have to have more. I have to have more. I have to have more. Nothing wrong with having more, but be content with food and raiment. Or, in other words, understand and accept that as long as you have clothes to wear and food to eat, God is taking care of your needs. If you accept that, that will help you so much in the decisions that you make. Because now you won't make decisions based on how it's going to benefit you financially. But you'll make decisions based on what is right. And then you won't make bad decisions. They that will be rich fall. The word fall, would you listen? The Bible says... If you do not agree with God that food and clothes are enough, you are going to fall. And here's what you're going to fall into. They would that would be which fall into temptation, snare, and foolish and hurtful lusts that drown you in destruction and perdition. So I'm going to look at those words. First, the word temptation. The love of money brings temptation. So think about it. What if you have clothes to wear and food to eat? But you need to do something wrong in order to get more than that. If you are not willing to be content with food and clothes, you know what you're going to do? You are going to be tempted to do something wrong to get more than that. You'll fall into temptation. You're tempted. Why? Because you love money. If you're not content. Otherwise, you'll be like, no, I'm fine. I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to do that wrong thing or that wrong thing. This wrong thing or this wrong thing. I'm not going to do something wrong to get more money. Because I'm content with food and clothing. That's what you're going to say. But if you're not content with food and clothing, you're not going to do You're going to fall into temptation. Because you say, well, I have to have this. Listen, if you ever say, I have to have this, the devil will bring you a sinful way to get it. And you'll say, I have to do this. Because I have to have it. Do you see how like that's the easiest way to fall into temptation? If you think, you think to yourself, well, I have to get this. I have to have that. The Bible says you don't have to have that. But you say, I have to have that. The devil says, okay, I'm going to offer you a job that involves doing something wrong. And then you'll take it because you have to have it. Or with a lot of people, the devil will say, you have to have that. So you don't have the money, so you'll have to steal it. Don't you know that that's where stealing comes from? Stealing is I'm not content with what I have and you have it and I don't have the money to get it, so I'm going to take it from you. That's stealing. That's what a lot of people do when they vote for a government official that will tax the rich and give the money to them. I want what the rich person has and and, and I can't get it, so I will vote for a, a, a politician who will take it from give to me. That's just stealing. That's where it comes from. The love of money is why politicians who tax the rich and give the poor, that's why they get in there, because people love money. And the only way they can get that money is to send the government to take it from the rich person so they can have it. That's what they want. Socialism is stealing. It is stealing. It's amazing to me people don't see that, but 
because you're saying, I want what that person has. I'm going to send someone who's bigger and more powerful, the government, to force that person to give it to me. It's stealing. I have a question. All the people who vote for a socialist who will take the money from rich and give to them, do you think every single one of those voters has something to eat, something to wear? I'd like to you to bring me a naked, starving voter who voted for a socialist. Show me. Do you know where the only naked, starving voters are? They're the ones who voted for socialism. Socialism destroyed their country, and now they're naked and starving because socialism destroyed their country. But they didn't start out voting because they were naked and starving. You know what that means? Socialism stealing because they're saying every single person who votes for a socialist candidate, they have clothes and they have food. And they're saying it's not enough. I want more, so we're going to steal from the rich and give it to me. Socialism is stealing, and it's a complete violation of 1 Timothy 6 8. But you know, we can point the finger out to them, now, can't we? Point the finger, oh, those bad socialists. But you know what? We all do the same thing, don't we? We all have times where we do something wrong or we fall into temptation. Why? Because we want more than food and clothes, and we can't get it without doing something wrong, so we do something wrong to get it. So, love of money brings temptation, but it also says the love of money brings a snare. Right? They don't will be rich, fall into temptation and a snare. See, temptation is pretty straightforward, isn't it? A temptation is pretty simple. It's you know when you're being tempted that it's wrong, but you just feel you want to do it so bad that you do it anyway. Right? That's temptation. It's the desire. But a snare is different. A snare is different. If you so a snare is a trap, right? So when I catch a mouse and I put cheese on that trap. And the mouse, and I, I don't know, use peanut butter has actually been scientifically shown to be more effective than cheese. Sorry, Wisconsin. Um, when I put out that trap, do you think that the mouse knows he's going to get caught in the trap? Of course not. If he knew, he wouldn't know. That's not temptation. The mouse isn't getting tempted by the trap. He is. He wants it. No, he doesn't know that he's going to die. It's a snare. There's a difference between a temptation and a snare. Temptation is you know it's wrong, but you do it because you want to do it really bad. That's temptation. A snare is you actually think it's going to be fine, but you get trapped. The mouse goes and eats the cheese and snap, gets caught. Why? It's a snare. He doesn't know. How does that relate to money? I don't even have time to tell you stories of how many people loved money and they destroyed their marriage, their family, their whole life, because they loved money. But they didn't know they were destroying their marriage and their family whole life. They just thought, oh, this is just a bigger job. There are many people. You have a man, and he is in a good church, and his family is growing, and he's got a strong marriage, and everything's going on well in his life. And he gets offered a job across the country somewhere else that makes more money. It's not a sin. It's not a sin to get a better job. Listen, he's not being tempted He's being caught in a snare and he doesn't know it. But listen, the reason he got caught in the snare is because he loved money. So he, it's innocent. I'm not doing anything wrong. They didn't ask me to have a job selling alcohol. They didn't ask me to have a job running a casino. They didn't ask me to join the mafia. That wasn't the temptation. It wasn't a temptation. It was a snare. Listen, <laughs> you really think that anytime someone offers you a job, you're always going to know that it's going to be a bad thing? No. But the love of money can cause you to fall into a snare. So here, this happened, has happened so many times. I've seen, I can tell you so many stories. So the man is in a good church, and he's got a strong family, and his marriage is doing well. And you know what he does? He gets offered a multi-million dollar job across the country. Because he loves money, and he's not content with food and clothes, he gets the job. That wasn't a sin. It's not a temptation to sin. It's a snare. Here's what happens. He moves to that area of the country, but he's doing it for money, and the devil's in the trap all along. And the Bible already warned him, not, thou shalt not take a higher-paying job thereof, but don't love money. The problem was not the job. The problem was his love of money caused him to take the job. He didn't take the job because he believed God wanted him to take the job. He didn't take the job because he prayed about it. He didn't take the job because he talked to his wife. He didn't take a job because he talked to his pastor. He didn't take the job because he read something in the Bible that made him think God wanted a job. He didn't do it for God. He didn't do it for his family. He did it because he loved money. And there's the snare. There is the snare right there. So here's what happened. This happens so many times. So he goes, and he moves to God's country. You know what happens? They can't find a good church. Or it's a job where 
he's always working and he can't be in church. And little by little, everything starts falling apart. And his job damages his marriage, and it damages his children because they never see their dad. And he's chasing after money. And then maybe he ends up traveling with his job, and now he falls into temptations that destroy his marriage because of travel. And before you know it, he's divorced, his kids all hate him, and he's not in church anymore. And he's destroyed his entire life in his testimony as a Christian. And you know what happened? He never made a conscious choice, I'm going to go out and sin. No, he got caught in a snare, and here was the problem. It was the root. It was the root. It was the root. The love of money is the root of all evil. It was a root that caused all those things to happen, and the root was the love of money. Listen, you better take care of the root, because you're not going to like the fruit. And the root is the love of money. The Bible warns you. If you have the love of money in your heart, there's a simple way to get rid of it. It's not hard at all. You just say, okay, God, you said food and clothes are enough. I have food and clothes. I'm happy. Okay, God, now whatever money you give me, I'll take. And I'll spend it how I believe the Bible teaches and you want me to spend your money. It's all your money, God. It's not mine. My life is yours, like we talked about on, on Saturday, on Thursday night. Total surrender, the burnt offering. Total surrender. Now, God could give you a million dollars and it wouldn't mess you up at all. You would use all that money for something good, and you would still um, make decisions based on the Word of God, and it would not destroy your life. It would not destroy your life. That happens to so many people. It's a snare, but it's a root, and it's the love of money. It's the root of all evil. It will cause all kinds of bad things to happen, but it's a snare, folks. It's tricky. It's tricky, and you don't see anything bad about it. No, I'm not, I'm not in sin. I'm not doing anything wrong. Pastor, it's not a sin to take a job. That pays double what I'm making now. It's not a sin to move away. It's not a sin to do this. It's not a sin to travel. It's not a sin to do this. No, none of those things are a sin. They may not be a sin, but it might be a snare. And the devil may have a trap already for you. But here's why you fell into that snare. Because you love money. The love of money is the root of all evil. So the love of money brings temptation. The love of money brings a snare. And then it says, And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men, in destruction and perdition. The love of money brings destruction. You know what destruction is? Destruction is something being destroyed. When you love money, many of the other things in your life that you value, that are important to you, will be destroyed. The love of money can destroy your marriage. The love of money can destroy your children. I'll tell you something. I work with someone whose father's dying. His father's a multimillionaire. And he wants nothing to do with his father. Because his father was always gone when he was young, traveling. He never got to see him because his father was running this multi-million dollar company. And his father was doing all kinds of wrong things. And he hates his dad so much he'll never do it. His father's dying. His father's trying to get a hold of him, trying to talk to him. He won't talk to him. And it's all because, listen, the love of money. The love of money destroyed, brought destruction to his marriage. Destruction to his children. This man. So sad to hear that story. Old man dying. Everybody hates him. Why? Because he loved money. He loved money. So the love of money brings destruction. Listen, the love of money brings perdition. Perdition is being lost or dying. It can cause you to make choices that will cause you to die young. Or it can cause you to not be saved because you're so focused on money that you never get to a point where you trust Jesus as your Savior. Or it can cause your children to not be saved because you don't have time to lead them to Christ because you're too busy chasing the almighty dollar. Or it can cause other people to not be saved because they look at your life and they want nothing to do with Christianity because you claim to be a Christian, but your love for money causes you to act in very unchristian ways. So it brings perdition. So food and raiment, number one. Number two, fall. It'll cause you to fall. And number three, there's another word I want to talk about. It's the word faith. It's in verse 10. It says, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In this passage, when it says the word faith, it says the faith. The faith in the Bible refers to Christianity. It refers to what we believe. That's the faith. You know the love of money can cause us to give up on our faith. It can call us, cause us to err from the faith. We can walk away from what we believe because we love money. And I'll tell you why that is. Because the more you love money, the more you're going to run into situations 
where the Bible is telling you to do something different than what you want to do, but because you love money. Remember, the Bible says you can't serve two masses. You masses can't serve two masters. You'll hate one or love the other. Okay. So what's going to happen is you have you're trying to serve two masters. I'm a Christian, but I also love money. I'm a Christian, but I also love money. What's going to happen? You're going to have a choice, and the love of money is going to tell you to do this, and God's going to tell you to do this in His Word. What are you going to pick? Jesus said, if you try to serve two masters, you are going to hate one and love the other. So if you love money, you are going to start wandering away from God. Because every time you have a choice between making more money or doing what God says, you're going to choose the money. And so you are going to err from the faith. Money will cause you to, the love of money, not money, the love of money will cause you to err from the faith. Okay, uh, so the love of money causes us to give up on our faith or err from the faith. Also, the love of money causes us to make choices that hurt us and others. Because what does it say? It says, they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Pierced themselves. Do you notice that? Pierced themselves. It wasn't someone else that pierced them. They pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many sorrows. The love of money will cause us to make choices that hurt us and others. Just like that story I told you about that rich man with kids that never heard from him. We'll, we, you will listen. You will hurt yourself if you make decisions based on money. You will hurt your marriage if you make decisions based on money. You will hurt your children if you make decisions based on money. Your children need to see parents that always say, we do what's right no matter what. We don't make decisions based on money. Because if we say, oh, we love God, we follow God, we're Christians, but then your parent, your children see you constantly making choices to always do the thing that will make you more money. Your children listen, they follow what you do, not what you say. I gotta tell you something. There are people like ambulance workers, paramedics, doctors, nurses, policemen, and factory workers that run um, that run a furnace that makes glass 24 hours a day. If they shut down that furnace, or dairy farms that have to milk cows, right? <laughs> if they shut down that furnace, it takes them 21 days to get it running again. They can't shut down the furnace of cardinal. It has to run 24-7, right? And you know what? Criminals don't rest on Sunday. Criminals break into, break into houses on Sunday, don't they? So listen, you have to have policemen that work on Sunday. They have to have people that, that and there are people who are going to miss church because of their job. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that there are Christian policemen in the Dells who, who didn't say, <laughs> it's Sunday, you got to go to church. We'll just let the criminals go around and ravage the whole town while I'm in church. Aren't you glad? Hey, how about this? Um, right now, I have a heart attack. And someone calls 911. And a recording says, I'm sorry, we can't take your call because we're all in church. <laughs> How about this? I have a heart attack. An atheist answers the 911, yes. Could you send an ambulance? And the atheist says, oh, I'm sorry, the ambulance driver is a Christian and she's in church. So we can't send anybody. You have to wait a couple hours. A couple hours later, I'm dead. Um, oh, I got this. Let's say the ambulance driver is an atheist. So that's good. <laughs> Because Christians all go to church. So we need to have a few atheists around while the Christians are in church, right? You know, I'm joking. So I go, oh, I have a heart attack while I'm preaching. <coughs> and uh, you call 911, the atheist answers. Uh, the atheist says, uh, well, I'm an atheist. You're in luck. I'm an atheist. I'm not in church today, so I can take over your car. Oh, and you're also in luck. When I look at my chart here, I see we have an atheist driving the ambulance, so... Uh, or else a carnal Christian who just would rather go uh, would rather go to work and, 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 and is just obeying God by not being in church. So anyway, we have we have, a, we have an atheist or a disobedient Christian driving the ambulance, an atheist or a disobedient Christian answering the phone. And now you're you're in luck. We're going to save your life. Woo -woo -woo! Ambulance comes up. You guys pick up Pastor Hunter, throw him in. Woo -woo -woo! He goes down, takes you to the hospital. You pull in to the hospital, and and they wheel you in quick, quick, quick. And then and then you look around, and the, the emergency room is empty. And they're like, sorry. Everybody that works in the emergency room is at church. You have to wait a couple hours. Now you die in the emergency room. Or then they look over and they go over to you, the paramedics, everything, and they go, oh, he needs open heart surgery. Stat, nurse, bring me. We need some blood. Uh, we don't have any blood because the person that runs the blood bank is at, <laughs> is at church. <laughs> or then you go, oh, wait, wait, wait. Um, uh, uh, we need open heart surgery. Well, they quickly bring them in. And they're like, where's the, where, where's the surgeon? 
And they're like, oh, uh, the surgeon is a Christian. He just tried his cell phone. So the pastor Hunter told him, shut off your cell phone in church. <laughs> <laughs> and he's in church. And so, sorry, you're just going to have to die on the operating room table because there's no surgeon there um, to uh, work on you because he's a good Christian. He went to church. You understand the point. The point is, there are a lot of jobs where you actually have to work while you are in church. And you know what? You and I are all glad that those people are not in church right now. We're all glad. Praise the Lord for being faithful Christians who believe in attending church, like the Bible says, but when it's their turn to work while everybody else is at church, they work to keep us all safe. Praise the Lord for that. <coughs> all right, having said that, how many Christians, though, do something that will make them money on a Sunday morning that they could have done on Monday morning? And they do that this week. And the kids see. Oh, mom is doing a job she didn't have to do on Sunday morning. Dad is doing something he didn't have to do on Sunday. He could have done it on Monday. But he makes more money. He makes more money if he works instead of going to church. So dad decided to stay home so he could make more money. Mom decided to stay home so she could make more money. Listen, you can do that once or twice. You do that over and over again. Do you know what your kids are going to conclude? Because kids follow what you do, not what you say. They're going to conclude that money is more important than church. Not just church, but God as well. And you do that enough times. Train up a child in the way he should go when he's old enough. You're training your child to not go to church and to love money. You're going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows, and your child is going to as well. The love of money causes us to make choices that hurt us and others. So nothing against people who work on Sunday if they need to work on Sunday. And we, we all know it's not commanded to meet on Sunday. You can meet any day of the week. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. That's what the Bible says. But you know what you should do if you have to work on Sunday? Come to church on Thursday that week. And you know what you should do if you have to work on Thursday? Come to church on Sunday. And you need to be in your Bible, too. Don't be so busy working that you're never in your Bible, and you're never reading, reading about it, never praying, never spending having devotions with your children, because they will come to the conclusion. Everything in the world is more important than the Bible. Everything in the world takes priority over church. Everything in the world takes priority over God. God is the lowest priority in our life. Listen, if God is the lowest priority in your life, God will be the lowest priority in your children's life. They'll pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So that's the word... The word food and raiment, okay? All you need is food and clothes. Everything else is bonus. Fall. You're going to fall into temptation, snare, destruction, perdition, faith. Listen, love of money is going to cause you to give up on your faith, and you're going to make choices that hurt you and hurt other people. But then in verse 11, look at this word. Verse 11, thou, man of God, flee these things. There's the word flee. There's another word, word flee. Um, when Gregory was little, we memorized this passage, passage with our whole family. Um, when we were uh, when, uh, when we were little, <laughs> when, <laughs> many years ago, we memorized the passage of family. We used to say it all together. And Gregory and uh, Gregory was really young; he was learning how to talk. And so we said that we would say the whole the whole passage, First um, uh, Timothy six, uh, eight through twelve. And so we would get through, and as we we're going through, we say, "But thou, man of God, flee these things." And Gregory looked at me and say, "Just like me, I'm fleeing," because <laughs> he was fleeing. <laughs> so, um, and so he thought that verse was talking about him. Um, so um, thou, man of God, flee these things. Listen, listen, listen. Oh, this is so important. As I was typing this out last night, I thought to myself, this is the one part of the message that I pray everybody grabs hold of. This word flee. Because Paul is talking about the love of money. And he said you need to flee it. He's not telling you to flee from money. He's telling you to flee from the love of money. And I thought to myself, this is really the most practical part of the message. This is what I really want you to pay attention to. What am I? What is the Bible saying when it says flee from the love of money? And how do you flee from the love of something? This is so important. Pay attention to this. What is fleeing? Or running away. It's, listen, it's, if, 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 if there's a bear chasing me 
and I'm fleeing from the bear. I'm running away from the bear. I'm getting as far away from that. And listen, I'm heading away from something. Away from it. Now, how do you head away from a love of money? Listen, when you love money, money determines the decisions you make. For example, there's two jobs advertised in the paper. One is offering you $20 an hour, and one is offering you $15 an hour. And you go, easy choice. And you apply for the job that's offering 20 Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but I have a question. Don't you think there's a few other things you should look to in those two, four and those two jobs than just the pay? Like, for example, what if the one that was $20 an hour said, you will inhale very harmful chemicals and die within five years? I think you'd apply for the $15 an hour job. So what I'm getting at is, no. if it was your, not you, I know. <laughs> this, this isn't about you. It's about the rest of us. <laughs> this is one, yeah, this, 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 there are some sermons that don't apply to everybody. <laughs> okay, anyway, I better go on. Yeah, that was a good one, Ken. Okay. The reason that you would not apply for that is because you actually do have something you love more than money. It's called your life. <laughs> you do actually want to live longer than five years, especially if you're like 40 years old. You probably want to live a little bit longer than five years. Probably your goal. Probably your wife's goal and your children's goal. Hopefully it's your wife and your children's goal. Well. <laughs> Hopefully it's your congregation's goal for the pastor to live longer than five years. Listen. The fact that you would not apply for that job if you were going to die within five years means there are some things that are more important than money. So I want you to listen. If you have two jobs, one's fifteen dollars an hour, one's twenty dollars an hour, don't just go. You know, so the thing is, the government, an occupational safe and healthy administration, OSHA, probably will make sure you that that job will not allow you to die within five years. But listen, there are some. There could be some other things in that job that won't be good for you and your family. Like, for example, how much time you spend with your family, how much you see, how much time you spend in church, how much time you have to serve God, who you'll be working with, and the influence they will be on you. What product that company is selling, and whether or not it's a positive impact on the world or a negative one. There are a lot of other things you should look at. And don't just go, oh, easy, $20 an hour, $15 an hour, I take the 20 no, you need to look at some few things. Listen, here's the danger. The danger is you will make a decision just simply for the money. And you could destroy your life. So when it says flee these things, listen, when you have a choice, do not, so fleeing is going the opposite direction, going away from something. Do not make the decision based on money. Make it based on a different reason. Not money. Don't make the decision based on money. When you make the decision based on money, you are following in that. You're following. You're fleeing. You're not fleeing the love of money. You're falling right into it. There's nothing wrong with it. If somebody offers you a job, a million dollars, nothing wrong with taking it. But don't make the decision just so you can make the million dollars. For example, this is actually a good illustration because... You, as a congregation, want me, as a pastor, to spend more time with you. You want me to be available to you. What if I got a job that had me working 60 hours a week, and I never had time to spend any time with you? You would not be happy about that, because you'd be like, where is his priorities? You're right. You would be right. So, for example, I actually switched to working at Cardinal, because I could make the same. And now, with profit sharing, I'm actually making the same amount of money working 12 hours, that I was making working 25 hours at Culver's. I cut my working time in half by working at Cardinal. So I have a lot more free time for being a pastor. Now listen, that choice was not for money. You know why? I didn't make more money. I, I worked less hours, so I have more hours for the kingdom of God and for my family and for you. So think about it. That was not based on money, but it was more money. But the choice wasn't for money. I'm just using that as an example, because that's practical for you. You wouldn't want a pastor you never saw because he's gone somewhere 60 hours a week. You wouldn't want that. 
And so you can see that, you can get that, you can understand that. Now take that and apply it to yourself. The choices that you make. Maybe you would take the million dollar job they offer you because you would be making a million dollars and you would have time for your family. And you'd have time for your children. So make the decision for a different reason, not purely for the money. Does that make sense? Maybe. Don't make the decision for the money. The money may be a good thing, but make it for a different reason. So that was the first principle. How do you flee? How do you flee the love of money? Listen, make a decision today. For the rest of my life, I am never going to do something only for money. I'm going to do it for a different reason. I may accept the money. I may make a lot, but I'm not doing it for money. Do it for your family. Do it for God. Do it for your church. Do it for your spiritual walk. Don't do it for money. Ask yourself that question. Every decision you make, everywhere you go, every job you apply for, every decision you make about your budget and how you spend your money, think this question. Am I doing this simply, purely, just to make more money? If you do that, listen, you're not necessarily sinning. But you're not fleeing either. See, it says, thou man of God, flee these things. To flee the love of money is to refuse to ever make a decision purely for money. But there's actually two ways you need to flee. The first one is never make a decision simply for money. And here's the second one. This is so important. You see, when you flee, you're proving that you don't love money because you're going in the opposite direction. You're proving to yourself, to God, to everyone, that you're not doing something simply for money. You're, you're fleeing. Okay, listen. Fleeing is doing the thing that doesn't make sense because everyone else is fleeing toward money, aren't they? Everyone else, unsaved people and people who aren't obeying the Bible, they're going toward money, toward money, and you're going away from it. It doesn't mean you're not making money, but it means that that's not the motive. That's not the reason you decide. You don't decide where to live based on money. You don't decide where to work based on money. You don't decide when to work. You don't decide any of your decisions. You never make them based on money. Otherwise, money is actually running your life, not God. Amen. And in fact, money is your God. If money is telling you what to do, God's not your God. Money's your God. Even if you don't have it, it's still your God. The desire for it is running your whole life, even if you don't have it. This is not a sermon for rich people. Rich people already have money. It's a sermon for people who want money. And that's all of us, isn't it? We all fall into that trap of desiring money. So listen, first of all, don't make decisions based on money. And second, there's one more thing that's how you flee. This is so important. <clears throat> Give your first fruits to God. Give your first fruits to God. You know, the New Testament teaches that they that preach the gospel should live in the gospel. Okay? So in the Old Testament... When they bought their brought their first fruits, okay, they brought the tithes, the ten percent. Listen, they did not touch any of their grain. They didn't eat one piece of wheat before they brought the wheat to the temple. They didn't take any of their animals for themselves or sell it or anything until they gave one tenth of all their animals to the temple. The first fruits. Here's why. This is why it's so important. It's a very important part of fleeing. Listen, you know what's logical? What's logical is to get your paycheck, buy everything that you need, and then give God what's left if you have some. That's logical. You know what's not logical? To give God what belongs to him first, and then use the rest for what you need. And I'd be willing to bet... Folks, I have no idea how much any of you make. Some of you have told you what I make because I'm always bragging about Cardinal and how good they pay. <laughs> Just one day a week, of course, not a million. I don't have any idea how much you guys make. Now, one of you have told me how much you get paid. But listen, you know what I can be sure of? Every single person here, pay attention, this is important. Every single person here, your paycheck, if you gave 10%, to God, when you got your paycheck, before you spent one penny, if you took 10% out and gave it to God, I guarantee you, you would have enough money left over for food and clothes. Guaranteed. Now, this doesn't make sense. 
wait, the pastor. I have so many other things. I've got bills. I got bills. I have a lot of bills. I have a lot of bills. Aiden always says he wanted to be the guy named Bill because everybody paid him. <laughs> <laughs> we all have bills. Listen, pay attention. One of the ways that you can prove you're fleeing is to do the thing that doesn't make sense and give your first fruits to God. Not your last fruits, your first fruits. Because you know what happens if you give your last fruits to God? You start getting a backlog on your tithes. It's like, well, at the end of the month, I didn't have enough for this, but I'll, maybe next month I'll do double. And the next, the next month I'll do triple. Next month, pretty soon you're so far you never catch up again. Give your first fruits to God. You know why that's fleeing? I think we can all agree that's fleeing. It's fleeing the love of money because you're proving that you don't love the money that you love God because you gave it to God before you spent any of it. So he's first. Does the Bible say, seek ye first the kingdom of God? First? Is God supposed to be first? Yeah, first. Never said he's supposed to be last. He's supposed to be first. So if God's first, you're like, listen, give the first 10% to God. And now you just proved that you don't love money. The Bible says to flee it. You know what we want to do with this message? This is our human nature. We want to say, okay, it's true. The Bible says don't love money. Okay, pastor, you made a good point. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go home. And I'm just going to try not to love money too much. And I'll be fine. I'll just try not to love money too much. That's what we want. That's the response we're hoping the pastor tells us is the right response. But listen, it doesn't even matter what my response is. The Bible says to flee the love of money. So the question is, in your day-to-day -day decisions, how are you fleeing? How are you running away from not money, but the love of money? You can prove that you don't love money by never, ever making money the reason why you do something, ever. Always make it be another reason, not money. And it should be, what does God want me to do? That should be the reason you do everything, right? To please God in all things. So God should be the reason why every decision you make, including if you take a job that pays a million dollars a year. It should be, I believe God wants me to take this job. Not because I want the money. But I believe God has offered me this job. God wants me to take this job. Take it. Nothing wrong with making a million dollars. But do it for God, not for the money. And only you and your heart know. So you decide in your heart. It's not for us to decide. I'm not going to ask you, oh, you got a new job. Did you do it for money? Did you do it for God? I'm not going to ask you that. You never asked me that? I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to say, praise the Lord. Brother so-and-so got a job for a million dollars. I think I can see 100000 more in our church budget this year. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to think it. I wouldn't say it. <laughs> Flee. Number one, don't make any decision based on money. Number two, give your first fruits to God. Prove you don't love money by giving 10% before you spend one penny. Prove it. Oh, pastor, I don't have to prove it. I already know I don't love money. Really? You know you don't love money, but you spend the whole thing, and then you just give God whatever's left over. But you know you don't love money. Okay. If that's proof to you, continue with that. But I got a warning for you. People who live that way, they end up piercing themselves through with many sorrows. It's not going to end well. Then there's a the word follow. You can't just flee. You also have to follow, right? You have to flee some things, but you have to follow other things. Here's what you're going to follow. Follow after. Flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You see... You know what you need in your life? You don't need more money. If you have food and you have clothes, you don't need money. That's not even what you need. The Bible says it. Food and raiment, be content. That's not what you need. You will get more than food and raiment, but you don't need more than food and raiment. Listen, you know what you need? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know what you need to have a good marriage? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know what you need for your children to turn out for God? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You know what you need to have a good testimony? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. We want all the wrong things. We're looking for things that won't even make us happy, that actually will hurt us instead of helping us, and we're not even looking for the things we really need. We need to be fleeing the love of money. And listen, you need to be making decisions based on that. If you're applying for two jobs, say to yourself, okay, which job would be best for righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness? That's what I'm looking for. 
And maybe both of them will. And so then you can take the one with more pay. That's fine. But make sure that's your motive, the decisions that you make. Righteousness is doing right. Godliness is making God our priority. So obviously, if that job is going to have you do something that's wrong, then it won't fulfill righteousness, will it? Godliness is making God our priority. If that job will cause you to neglect God and not make him the priority in your life, that's not for that's not for God. Listen, that's not for you. Listen, faith is trusting God to provide for your needs. If you think, I can't take get that lower paying job because I won't have enough money, you're not making the decision based on faith. You're not trusting God to provide for your needs. Love is meeting the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. If that job does not allow you to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of your wife and your children, or your fellow church members, then you're not making the job for the right decision. Patience is putting up with unpleasant circumstances. That's patience. If you say, oh, I could never do that job because that would irritate me too much. Because I don't like that kind of work. <clears throat> now you're not making the decision based on patience. You're making it based on money. And meekness. You know what meekness is? It's giving up your right to do your own will. If you are applying for a job because that's the job you really want and you really don't want to do the other job, now you're not making the decision based on meekness. Meekness is giving up your right to have your own way and do your own will. Follow. Don't just flee. But also follow. Follow righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Listen, if you make that your goal, this is what I want, God. I want righteousness in my life. I want to do what's right. I want to make God my priority. I want to trust God for my needs. I want to meet the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others, especially my own family. And I want to put up, be willing to put up with unpleasant circumstances, and I want to give up my right to follow my dreams and do what I want with my life. If you make that your goal, it'll be pretty clear which job you should take, it'll be pretty clear what choice you should make. And you know what? When you make that your goal, the money's not even going to matter. It's not even going to matter to you because now you have totally new priorities. The last word is fight. It says fight, the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Listen to this. Pay attention. When we love money, we fight people instead of the devil. It says, fight the good fight of faith. The good fight of faith is you, you can fight the devil. You know who your enemy is? It's not your wife. It's not your children. It's not your husband. It's not your fellow church member. It's not even President Biden. It's hard to believe, but it's not. It's not even your pastor. You know who your enemy is? Your enemy is the devil. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion walking about seeking whom you may devour. Listen, the devil is your enemy, and you've got to fight him. But when you love money, you know what you're going to do? You're not going to fight the devil. He'll be your best friend. He'll encourage you and help you. Oh, you keep loving money. He'll be your friend. He's not going to fight you. You'll fight people. You'll fight people because your priorities are wrong. You'll probably fight with your wife because you're not seeing her because you're pursuing money. You'll probably fight with your children because they never see you because you're pursuing money. And you'll probably fight with other people because they're making more money than you. You will start to fight because you love money. We'll fight the good fight of faith. When we love money, we fight people instead of the devil. And he says this, lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. And when we lay hold of eternal things, we let go of temporary things. If you're following eternal things, you won't care about money. Because you're following eternity, you care about the souls of men and eternal things. And then a couple of questions. Does your life match up with what you say you believe? Think about it. If you say you're a Christian, you live for heaven, you live for eternity, you care about the souls of men, you care more about having a good marriage, you care about more about being a good testimony, you care more about serving God and pleasing Him. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God. If you say that, does your life match up with that? Because the decisions you make every day shows what your real priorities are. And then, another question, if you say you're a Christian, but you love money, why should a non-Christian believe you? Not saying you're not, I'm just saying if you say you're a Christian, but you love money, why should a non Christian believe you? Oh, listen, I want to tell you something. At the end of your life, you are not going to care how much money you made. It's not going to matter. At the end of your life, you know what you're going to care? Did I please God? Did I bring people into the kingdom? You know, you can bring people into the kingdom just with your giving. Because you can give to missions, and you can give to churches and pastors, and, and you can give to causes that will cause people to come to Christ. Listen, you're going to care if you brought people to Christ. You're going to care if you lived a holy life for God. You're going to care if you had a good marriage. You're going to care if your children serve God. That's what you're going to care about. You're not going to care about money. 
So start living now for what you're going to care about at the end of your life. Don't wait till then and then it's too late to change it. Do it now. Just change it. Just today, say, okay, God, I'm done with this. I'm done with loving money. I am going to decide that if I have food and clothes, that's all I need. And now I'm going to make decisions based on God's kingdom. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this reminder. Father, we struggle with this so much in America. The love of money really is the root of all evil, being discontent, and wanting something that we don't need. Father, we really only need food and clothes. So I pray, Father, that today each one of us will decide we are going to be content. If we have food and clothes, we'll be content. And now anything God gives me beyond this is a gift from him. I'm happy to use it. Nothing wrong with it, but I'm not going to love it. I'm going to love God, and I'm going to make every decision every day based on what God wants me to do, not based on money. And I'm going to honor God with my first fruits. Father, thank you for this reminder. I pray that Dell's Methodist Church would not be a church that loves money. We would be a church that loves God and loves people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, man.